My name's Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. And I'm Tom Scholey. We're going to be looking at uh, some primo era Jim Lee X-Men art. First, Jimmy, what do you have for us? Join me on patreon.com slash jimrug where you can download my out-of-print zines and mini comics like this ad house catalog of my ballpoint pen drawings. It's available now on my Patreon. You can also see a lot of my original art in the process that I make, Street Angel and Octobriana and all the comics that I make, uh, and a whole lot more on patreon.com slash jimrug. Tom. Hey, you like X-Men. Here's Jack Kirby, the creator of the X-Men, along with his buddy Stan Lee. Uh, and and many more of your uh, comics favorites at, at Marvel and DC. This is uh, Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics, his whole life story told in comics form, the, the form that he himself worked in. I also did um, Fantastic Four Grand Design, which is the story of the Fantastic Four, uh, sort of a companion piece to this book. And uh, you can check out my new comics on Patreon. Just search Tom Scholey on patreon.com. And I have a uh, YouTube channel, Total Recall Show. Red Room Comics are in the wild, man. Finally got my comps for issue number two. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is the name of the game in the Red Room universe. Every issue, completely self-contained. They're going to be coming out on a uh, monthly basis. So if you see an issue, grab an issue. You're going to get a complete experience for your money's worth. These comics available in finer comic shops, or you can order, pre-order the comic, get it put on your pull list at your local shop, or from the Fantagraphics website. If you want to read the comics ahead of time, hit up my Patreon, patreon.com slash edpiscor. Three bucks get you the archive there. And uh, new pages come out every Tuesday with well over 100 up there as we speak. All those links are in my link tree in the description below this video. Fellas, let's get to the Jim Lee trilogy of issues that introduce Electra Psylocke. <laughs> <laughs> 256 to 258. I also call this the Jim Lee, Frank Miller suck fest because there are so many connections that we can draw to the great Frank Miller comics of yore. And we just got to highlight this real quick, man, that you're kings of kayfabe. We don't fake the funk, man. You see what this barcode is, man. You know what this means. We pick this shit up from places where we didn't even know comic shops existed, man. My shit came from the local uh, the local drugstore. Yeah, it was 7-Eleven for me. <laughs> Mine were uh, West Side News. It was a little tiny newsstand shop in, in, in my hometown. Seven years old, man. X-Men was one of the constants in my life, month in, month out. And in my day, it was at a level of popularity that you never had to worry about missing an issue on the newsstand. It would be... X factors, new mutants that would uh, be the sporadic ones. But I was able to grab my Batmans. I was able to grab my X Men's month in, month out from probably honestly age four before I knew how to read the written word to uh, with X Men to the Joe Mad era uh, with Batman. The second he got his back broken and you wanted me to start <laughs> reading Catwoman comics to read the next part of the story. Get the fuck out Come of on, here. Come on, dude. That was only like a 28-part story. <laughs> yeah. I feel like you're not a loyal Batman fan. Get the fuck out of here. All right. Speaking of a reappraisal, Ed. Yes. <laughs> I bought these off the newsstand as we established. I uh, thought these were really cool. Rereading them this week. I hope I never read another Chris Claremont comic. <laughs> these are unbelievable. And, you know, you mentioned reading them before you were even really a reader. I feel like you could actually damage yourself. It reminded me of Billy Madison at the end whenever he's like, we are all more stupid for having heard your answer to that question. That's how I feel after reading this. I would rather do drugs to destroy brain cells than read more of these comics. Horrible from a reading experience. It's, it's insane, right? Like, Chris Claremont built a new wing on the, on the Marvel offices with his work with, you know, John Byrne, that, that early era up to the Dark Phoenix, maybe and beyond, uh, and really established, you know, X Men as a, the primo comic for for Marvel Comics. But then, uh, with that name equity and with the trust that editors give you, because editors can't do what you do, you know, and they don't know the magic, right? So you establish all of this. Well, let's uh, let's uh, get a couple more bites of that apple. Let's create a new comic. We'll call it New Mutants. Let's create another comic. How about a Wolverine comic? How about a few mini series every? fucking uh year now chris claremont is writing two to three hundred uh pages worth of comics a month and spreading himself very very thin and he admits that you know he he completely admits that uh and then we get to this place uh what it reminded me of 
is like how much the art floated my interest sure, yeah. uh, at, at, at this time. 100%. And it was like all about the drawing because even like this Tom Orzakowski lettering is much smaller than your typical uh, comic lettering from this time. And the print is very smeary and kind of hard to read. Like it, it just was not attractive to me as a kid. It's just like bringing all this stuff back after uh, reading this thing. You see that Jim Lee is getting more and more comfortable in that spirit of the uh, the anchor images, mm -hmm. you know, he would always draw cool stuff. But when Carl Potts was was laying out those pages for a Punisher, he had to fit his cool drawings within the actual story content. Here, he's uh he's sort of you know he's becoming who he is. This is pinnacle Jim Lee Jim Lee artwork, man. How disappointed would you be if you owned a Jim Lee page and it was this page? Yeah, like your anchor is just this guy in a silhouette style <laughs> black suit. Absolutely, man. Now. The three main characters, I would say, like um, in these comics, it's Psylocke, it's uh, it's it's Wolverine, it's Jubilee, and Frank Miller did that. Carrie Wolverine. Kelly, yeah, Carrie right. Kelly, yeah. baby. Carrie Kelly colors, Robin he, colors, sunglasses. He, Jim Lee turned Mark Silvestri's Jubilee into Carrie Kelly. Mm -hmm. Psylocke is Electra. We have the hand, so there's all of that baggage, and Miller did do that. Uh, Frank, that um. Wolverine miniseries, you know? So it's all here. Also, by the way, Operation Wolf, man, where I used to also get my comics was Hill's Department Store, and they had uh, Operation Wolf with that <laughs> very functional, uh, recoiling yeah, the, Uzi. Yeah, the Uzi, yes. yeah. <laughs> with the little red button grenade launcher. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, man, so we are launching into Chris Claremont Universe right now, where nothing you read is reality. Now, um, like... You know, we, we did Faust number one, and, like, I didn't really understand what I was reading. This was a similar experience. Yes. I didn't really understand what I was reading, but it is one of those things. Sometimes you age out of certain things, and I think, like, as a kid, it's a very different experience, of course, than it is for us now. Because, like, when I was a kid reading the, the, uh, this comic and, and, you know, other comics of its type, you're like... I want to learn about the world. I want to learn about these characters. You got stuff to tell me. I don't know anything. So you're just kind of treating everything with like equal importance. Like this is important. This is going to pay off. I'm going to pay careful attention. And then, you know, I didn't have that many comics either. So it's like, okay, I'm going to reread this thing a couple times. Whereas now it's like, okay, we got things to do. I don't have all day. <laughs> you better like make it worth my while. You know, we, so we just can't get in that that mindset. You know. Well, also there's the promise of the next issue. The yeah. stuff that I don't get from this one, I'll get it next. Yeah, week, and, next and month. We uh, assume it's going somewhere, but as adults, we know it's know. not. It's right. not going anywhere <laughs> at all. You know? This is uh, this is some Jim Lee trying to approximate Frank Miller's storytelling, and it's just it's so clunky and, and goofy because. Would Frank Miller say hit it and then show you the foot putting the pedal to the metal and then show you a speeding <laughs> wheel like that? This is superficial nonsense, man. Yeah, this is Chip Kid showing you a picture of an apple and then showing you the word apple and yes. saying one or the other. Yes. Yeah, again, I mean like the the appeal is undeniable that like just like of like lines. And colors and shapes. Jimmy, don't you wish this guy <laughs> drew the uh, WCW comic oh, for, for um, I, I, that, That's what we'd be reviewing right now if that were the case. <laughs> or Zikowski's lettering, that guy is so up for the challenge. Yes. Like, I feel like a, of all these letters from this era, Or Zikowski's is the most animated, lively, bouncing around the page. And I think sometimes it's out of necessity. How do you fit all these words around a character or whatever? But he still does this kind of stuff of jumping around, and it's just very dynamic. Was watching uh, this this uh, this Jim Shooter interview. He said that uh, when they were figuring out like royalty structures, all that stuff, there is no no space for for letter or or colorist to receive royalty. Like it was determined that nobody's buying a book for the colorist, nobody's buying a book for the letterer. He said Chris Claremont is the one guy out of his own pocket. Like they they had big meetings and. Uh, we're talking to the freelancers, like, if you give up, like, you know, tenth of a point or something, all of you, we could give uh, letterers and colorists uh, royalties, and they all said no. Chris Claremont, from his own royalties, uh, gave Orzakowski and the and Glennis Ween uh, points uh, off, off his package, man, for, for, uh, for royalties. 
He should have been required to do that. <laughs> <laughs> He's putting them through their paces. Especially yeah. Orzakowski, man. That guy, nobody worked harder on a monthly book lettering than Orzakowski on X-Men. So this is that Chris Claremont is a man, like we've seen the little little baby girl driving a Testarossa, doing a Knight Rider turn, and when she gets out, she's this person. And and Doug Ramsey's there. And you hear that word mojo, and you see this guy right here, and things aren't lining up. So it's sort of letting you know we're not in Kansas anymore. Also, if you were a devout reader of X-Men comics, you knew that that Storm is no longer like an adult in this moment. Yeah, there's so that's so much inside baseball yeah. that you're giving. If you just gave somebody these three issues to read, they wouldn't know any of what you just said. Uh-uh. And then you flip the page, and she's even different looking, Psylocke is, man. She's a full different person. And they t they're they talking about, like, if, if we're going to be in Hong Kong, like, she can't look like a wasp. So they start to, you know, add some, some stuff to her, some different skin tone, start to change her eyes a little bit. Now she's an a Asian assassin. What the hell, right? Yeah, I'm not going to try to explain that. Yeah. <laughs> that one still doesn't make sense. And, that, you know, that's after reading 150 other issues of X-Men. But then you cut to, like, presumably real time. And she's in a Star Wars back to tank. So earlier with this Mojo stuff, it's suggesting the body shop and Spiral and, like, those people, like, manipulating her, like, like they did long shot and all this. But I guess that's all just memory or things that are implanted while these guys are changing this girl up uh by the way this is direct like post siege perilous so I'm wondering when you're going to explain that one i know right and furthermore from this point forward we have our uh electra psylocke with a way bigger thong than uh electra had and when she starts to confront the x-men that's not reality either it's just an opportunity for Jim Rugg to draw... Uh, Jim Rugg. <laughs> Freudian slip. <laughs> for, for, for Jim Lee to... Fabian slip. <laughs> for Jim Lee to draw some, some X-Men in this fucking comic for once. It's almost even more confusing as we're going through it now and I'm listening to you explain it. Yeah. I think when I was rereading it this week, you'd just skip certain things and just be like, don't think about that part. Yeah. Don't think about Colossus being a painter now in New York or whatever, like... Yeah. What is going on? It's only like halfway through this three-parter that it kind of gels for me. And it's only because it's like enough of all this stuff. Here's Wolverine in a black suit with his claws out. And it's like, okay, I get it. <laughs> that really is sort of the heart and soul of this run. Yeah. To break it down, uh, first issue is these bad guys get their hands on Psylocke. And they're trying to create the next great hand assassin yeah the one thing that i really like about this issue and the way they characterize all of what you just said is when they're explaining her she's in the tank and, and he's talking to mandarin the leader of the hand or whatever is talking to mandarin about like we think she's an x-men and i love how special it makes x-men like we have caught this thing that is you know above and beyond the hand and our history like we think we've got an x-men here like let's go to let's work together <laughs> let's see what we can do with this and here she is, bending the knee, pledging fealty to the hand. Let's see how that shakes out, as she is now Lady Mandarin. Good drawings all yeah, throughout, just man. virtuoso stuff. I think that's an early Jim Lee Scott Williams team-up. Yeah. Because the previous issue of X-Men that he drew, I think it was 248, I think Dan Green inked it. Right. And now we're going to see in the second part, Joseph Rubenstein inks it, so like, the Jim Lee Scott Williams team was not what it would, you know, go on to become. I think it forms right around this time, maybe. I don't know if you did any Punisher War journals or not with him. Yeah, I don't think so. Uh, even stuff like this, like simple story panel to panel stuff, is confusing if you don't have the writing uh, in there. Where you see her on the ground, beat up, and then the very next panel, she's just standing, holding holding the guy. It was just an illusion? <laughs> of course it was. <laughs> yeah, I think if, if you're going to do these kind of like illusions, mindfuck kind of stories, you have to be extra clear. Yes. Yes, and, and I don't know that that's very possible in a Marvel method. Especially in this era of Claremont. Like, it's just so much is happening. I don't know about Clarity being uh, one of them. The serpent print backgrounds are like Frank Miller um, Wolverine miniseries stuff. You would see that a lot there. 
I really like that yeah. panel. That oh, might be yeah, one more of my fan, favorite panels anything, of, yeah. the, of the uh, book. Just that matchup, too, of the blue and pink is very pleasing to me. Yeah. Especially for a background. It, it's great for creating that depth. There's some interesting wash thing happening, too, with the with the dots. So, yeah, here's Carrie Kelly. Yes. We're wearing the Robin colors and the <laughs> Carrie Kelly, Kelly shades. And Absolutely. just like a really nicely drawn Wolverine, well attired. Like Wolverine keeps having all these like great costume changes through through the the story. All I think to kind of set up when he does kind of like burst out in like a superhero outfit. And Chris Claremont just can't give you something regular, man. He's got to add more baggage. So now we have the ghost of Nick Fury and I think Carol Danvers. Yeah, that's right. Tagging along. <laughs> <laughs> so ridiculous. What the hell, man? I do like this Jim Lee drawing, though. There, there's definitely some stuff he's doing in this three-issue arc that I don't think becomes standard Jim Lee, you know, part of his practice. True. Certain rendering here and there, maybe an angle that we wouldn't see very often, and I and it stands out. I love it. There's there's even little bits where my mind goes to Kevin Nolan. Like oh, this, that's interesting. Like this Jubilee face. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was going to call out Golden again. I know yeah. that we mentioned Oh, definitely already, Golden. But definitely there are panels golden. where, like, we were critical of Joseph Rubenstein inking Golden on Micronauts, at least I was. And I feel like here, Rubenstein is now employing a bunch of Golden-isms on top of this Jim Lee art. Well, this this is, like, eight or nine years later. So sure. he's kind of, you know, figured it out. Um, the Jim Lee Image Comics establishing shot. <laughs> I know exactly where this scene's taking place now. <laughs> you know, all... Any to, to me, anybody who like ever had a comic on newsprint never looked as good as when they were on newsprint. Yes, you know, like I, I, I feel like it, it, everything that Jim Lee's done in like the past twenty years, if you give it this kind of printing, it, it's going to take it to another level. And I, I think that's to a person. There are people who kind of entered the game after digital, after you know, slick paper, who figured out how to do that, but. This is a classic Jim Lee kind of pose <laughs> that I think he's really good at, getting the back muscles in there and stuff. Yeah. You'll see that again and again throughout his comics and always works for me. Back muscles are hard to do well. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. He'll do this a lot too, man. We have the, the naked steam <laughs> bath sequence with the head <laughs> cocked up. There's California boys, man. Fun in the sun. What a wild page to think about Jim Lee. You know, I can't imagine him doing something like this ever again. You know, just some kids on the street. Couple comedic bits here and there throughout the, throughout the set, but but he really amps up the Carrie Kelly energy with uh, with with Jubilee in such a big way throughout this whole thing. Yeah, I think on that page we're seeing like a little like Keith Giffen, uh, uh, John Dimitrius. Uh, like uh, Justice League kind of stuff, like the goofing around right. kind of superheroes. Right, right, yeah, yeah, with the facial expressions and stuff. And doing the, the plots. Right, exactly. So so then you uh, you flip the page. You're never not reminded that it's a Chris Claremont comic because then you just have that page. And, and you wonder, like, what the breakdown of the issue looks like. And, like, Claremont was like, I need one more page. Like, let's just throw a page of Muir, Muir Island in there to like see what the other X-Men are doing right now. I used to see like uh, writing exercises and making comic exercises where you'd take a comic and you'd reverse engineer, you know, like mm -hmm. the script or the plot or whatever. It'd be ridiculous to try to like reverse engineer what is happening on Muir Island in this scene. Just a thrown in page, man. So here's where this comic clicks for me. <laughs> 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 and it is like, okay, we got to do a bunch of stuff. Okay, because you, you can't just have this. I'm you know? with you 100%. Once the ninjas show up, I'm, I'm back on board. <laughs> and this looks like it's from a Miller, like, like one of his first Daredevils. Yeah, like that wharf kind of scenario. Mm -hmm. You see all the stuff, man. You see nunchucks. <laughs> Do you see the tangent? You're going to love this tangent of the oh, sewer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, but, but, but Jim, it's not a tangent because this has moved down just a little Got bit. It. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I like. I feel like this is kind of the image thing of it's like okay, we're free. We can do things our own way. Let's throw out all that other stuff and just do the you know popping the claws and ninjas. Yeah, and I mean, is Bob Harris the the editor man? Like, I don't see Jim Shooter's name on here at all, man. So the inmates are running the asylum right now. Got our confrontation between Lady Mandarin and and here's the other ridiculous part, right? She is so clearly changed compared to the little pink-haired Psylocke that we've seen back in the day. And Wolverine's looking at her and saying, what, the face? Now, 
it's Wolverine. And we've seen a million times where there would be like, say, Mystique is in the form of Professor X or something. And Professor X is there and Wolverine sinks his claws into the one because he could smell. Yeah. Why don't you just say like, you don't, you smell like Psylocke or, you know what I'm saying? It's, uh, that ain't right. <laughs> she, or she's clearly changed. I like this uh, pink over here. This yeah, energy. Colored, yeah. All right, man, let's wrap things up, right? There's a lot of dangling mm -hmm. threads. We're going to tie it all back together. Plus, Scott Williams is back. <laughs> now, this is the stuff that would make Jim Shooter go insane, man, because we have, like, our meditating Wolverine here. Now, we're supposed to just know that this silhouette in the back of the tank is Wolverine. It's never, like, established visually once. You just have to... Every time you see this guy, it's just a little stick figure. Even this, you can't clearly tell that that's Wolverine. I wish this was the only problem with it. <laughs> <laughs> and once again, we're getting into more psychological warfare, or more more headspace, more astral plane bullshit. That's I'm, some good stuff with Wolverine's body, like the boils and shit. Oh yeah, it. man, this is some Cronenberg. Yeah, it looks nice. I mean, you had Basket case you had shit. Weapon X, the Barry Windsor Smith. I was, Not yet. I was no, wondering. This predates that. I believe this. Yeah, pre but it's it's right about concurrent. But I think Weapon X is maybe right after this. And uh, and then my evidence for that is the lack of like wires and and, oh, and uh, bubbles yeah. and stuff in the water. <laughs> this feels like something. Is this a famous yeah. image? Is that being pulled from know. somewhere? Yeah, I don't know about that, but I, but I do think that it's real sharp how yeah, Psylocke adapt, adopts the same pose. You yeah, know? that does look good. That's like the closest thing that that sells you on the fact that she's like inside his mind at this moment or also, whatever. Also, the choice to use screen tone on that Psylocke drawing, like I always wonder what what inspires those kind of decisions. Mm -hmm. This is some of the best Jubilee firework work in. Uh, I think Jim Lee kicked ass with Jubilee. I love all of this, like her acrobatics bouncing around and stuff. Through the legs. Like, it's, that's the most Carrie Kelly piece. It, 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 uh, yeah, I, I feel like I've seen that in Dark Knight Returns, that pose. Uh, that's interesting. Like, her, ha her out, hanging uh, on to, like, a pipe or something as she's, like, you know, falling out of a building. It reminds me of Extinction Agenda. You know, like, she's pretty animated through the Jim Lee parts of that as well. We're building to that, man. Mm -hmm. Like, if you remember his issues of Extinction Agenda, it's Wolverine... Jubilee and Psylocke are the, like, they happen upon Genosha together. So this is how we get them together in order to make that stuff happen. I think when we were looking at the Jim Lee Artist Edition, some of these pages were in there. And we, got to, right. we got to see the uh, the screen tone on, on this uh, blazer. And here it's applied diagonally. And what do they do? They they <laughs> they get hold of Jubilee and then they turn her to like a geisha. They just force her to wear geisha gear, but not before we go back to Muir Island and set up some more dangling plots that we might be able to pick up in the deadline crunch next next month. And Banshee, like any writing, the more you write about Banshee and his sonic scream, the lamer he becomes. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Lee drew the best Banshee hair, though, for my money. You know, like, yeah, we're looking at this from, like, a storytelling perspective, a clarity perspective, and it's, like, just, just not doing so great on that. But you just think about the stuff that's a little more intangible, like, all the gear he's designing, all the all the costumes, all the bits of technology, and, like, that's that's where the real effort is going, and that's that's where, like, the innovation is going. And I do think, like, like a child's mind or, like, a, like a, a young adult's mind is going to be a lot more tuned into that stuff. So soap opera is a term that's always brought up with these comics and it's it's pieces like this that really kind of like sell that and that term would be in the letters pages all the time and my mom was watching her stories around this time and this is way cooler than than Victor Newman at the at the at the makeup factory doing his thing man but still with the psychic weirdo shit like we have Legion and then his face just changes now if you read the old Sienkiewicz lead uh new mutants issues you sort of get the multiple personalities and how he could change his look but like you're given none of that and all that stuff happened 
six years ago in, in <laughs> New Mutants. Like, Claremont is just, like, in his own world, man. It does feel far out for, this is a fill-in, essentially this is a fill-in artist, and then he has to attend to all of these characters and subplots. Here's the Jubilee as, like, subservient geisha girl. So in all three of these issues, there's been, like, psychic warfare that ha that doesn't have anything to do with the real world. It's all it's all headspace stuff, man. And it's well established. Wolverine's the steel trap with the mind. She's trying hard to get inside the head, but stick figure Wolverine in the back to tank. He's fighting it every step of the way, and he gets help from the ghosts <laughs> that he's been carrying around with him for a couple of issues. It's uh, Chekhov's gun. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All the plot threads converge. Claremont's ghosts. And it's the ghost of Nick Fury that's like shooting the tank open. With ghost bullets. <laughs> oh my goodness. And this is another Chris Claremont-ism. The, uh, the, the girl characters are all like you know luke skywalker or you know they have this like inherent major potential that comes out in glimmers mm -hmm. and little spurts and fizzles man and needs to be harnessed with the school and it's never established any like any big moment where like you know psylocke throws wolverine down at the feet of uh the mandarin but then you turn the page, and now she's going after the Mandarin. And it has to be explained on the very, very last page that all her sense got knocked back into her. Yeah, I'm just thinking, for, like, from a kid's perspective, it's like, there's something going on here. There's a lot of people very, like, involved in a lot of different plots and things. Like, this is, if, if I just spend enough time and enough money with this series, I'll eventually be in on it too. That's not far from how I felt as a, as a little dude, as this stuff kept going on, because I was, I was young and I just automatically assumed that I'm just not getting it. Mm -hmm. There's a, uh, there's a real Stan Lee, um, writing what you see. Yes. And throughout this, this dialogue, right? Uh, right? I'm looking at the page, I think before that yeah. one, maybe yeah. whenever we see Wolverine, you know, coming up behind him and he's like, uh, you were shamming Wolverine, feigning defeat. It's almost like, let me literally describe <laughs> everything that is happening as you're reading it. And thankfully he does, because I wouldn't be able to explain any of this if he didn't. <laughs> yeah, totally. But it's it's such that, you know, the thing that, that Stan Lee is often criticized for, Claremont does the same thing throughout these X-Men comics. And here's where he's going to, like, in, like, add a little drama to the mixture, because Psylocke is a psychic, uh, psychic warrior, so Jubilee is suggesting that, you know, this could be a trick. You know, she could be pulling the swerve, man. Yeah, I love that Jubilee hates her. <laughs> yeah. This this is Inception. Maybe they're still in a dream within a dream. Excellent lighting on a lot of these images that Jim Lee is putting down, man. It's such bizarre dialogue. The brakes are off, Bets. All my inner ghosts and demons are running free. I doubt even Charlie, old Prof Xavier himself, best skull scanner of the breed, could handle that mess. <laughs> it's, it is an exercise to read this stuff. Chris Claremont, I'm telling you, man, he's that way in real life. Like, he's, <laughs> when you have a person who doesn't say that something is a blank slate and, and that it's a tabula rasa, <laughs> like, you're just going to get that kind of... <laughs> Dialogue treatment. Is his house his sanctum sanctorum? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that you pulled these, Ed. This is uh, something in my mind that was very different than the reread <laughs> revealed to me. Yes. But it is some of my favorite Jim Lee. Yes. Uh, there, there's some really cool stuff in there, especially for... I grew up loving... You know, Wolverine was my number one yeah. guy at the time, so uh, kind of a soft spot for this stuff, and Jim Lee makes him look great. But it's it's kind of cool historically to think about. This is Jim Lee showing up this is his first really big, I think, trial of like, hey, do you want to draw this book? Give it your shot here. Uh, I don't know, man. I enjoy that. I like seeing these guys that are just like going for it. Yeah, it's a great eyeball massage. There's just like a lot of 
things to look at. There. Man, there's a lot to like thinking of it from like, okay, you're going to draw this in a couple of weeks while, you know, on top of your Punisher assignment or whatever your busy schedule is. There's so much in each of these issues in terms of how much is drawn, how many characters he's juggling. All of those subplots that we we're kind of laughing at, they're like nine, eight, nine panels a page of like, here's seven more characters, Jim, handle them. A lot of pencil mileage. Uh, the reread of this really did remind me of the fact that I was I was buying this on the strength of the artist and we we were sort of you know like hard, hard on uh hard on these guys about um you know go the editors switching from Claremont to the artist you know to Jim Lee calling all the shots I was buying this on the strength of of the artwork uh so Vestry was like was getting that ball rolling for me and then when Jim Lee popped on, it was like, it really was kind of all about the art because that story, Byzantine to say the least, man. I love that Silvestri stuff. Yeah. That, that, that's a real strong run in my mind. Uh, and, you know, as you said, a guy that precedes Jim Lee, who everybody, so much acclaim for Jim Lee, but that Silvestri stuff was pretty rad. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was into it. That, was, that got me into the I used game. to always think he drew the, like, the really tiny little legs and ankles. Yes. And I'd try to emulate that, figure that part out. For sure, man. It, it's just like such a clear like dividing line, too. Like you, you look at other comics from this era, and there were still comics that still looked like a 60s Marvel. So it was kind of like, okay, this is some new thing that we haven't seen before. I wonder how much Claremont was on board for that. Because X-Men does look different than other books from that era. Like, did he have that taste? Was that him that was like, let's get this guy, let's get, let's give this dude a shot, or if, if, uh, add him to your list of potential fill-ins? If the stuff that, that Jim Shooter said in his interview is true, uh, Chris Claremont absolutely was going after all the best artists that he, that he could find, and was the guy... Like, he brought Silvestri onto the thing... Uh, they were all at a convention. It might have been San Diego. Silvestri is showing uh, samples to uh, Jim Shooter, and is is uh, considering like working with him on uh, like he was doing King Conan stuff, but very sporadic, very small. Was even doing stuff over at like First or something a after that. Uh, Claremont s saw those pages and was like, "Let's get him on X Men. Brand new guy, you know." But. Uh, Claremont broke talent, you know, Paul Smith, like what are, were his credentials really before that? I wouldn't doubt that he made the choice to bring Jim Lee into the, the game uh, with the Uncanny X-Men. And I think the other piece of this comic is the history of like, this is when the, the rocket really takes off for that whole image era, you know, because they were all clicking. As you said, buying this stuff on the newsstands, you know, my best memory of that is getting a double-sized X-Men by Jim Lee and a double-sized New Mutants by Rob Liefeld. Like there were several of these artists, but they were all sort of taken off. This would have been leading into uh, 1990 was McFarlane's Spider-Man, right? Yep. You know, uh, you mentioned like they side with the artist. Everybody sided with the artist in 1990. You know, that was sort of like maybe never again if you're Marvel after Image happens. But at that point, like those artists were just, I mean, they were all competing and, you know, rockets to the to, to the stars. It was really using the, the, the system for, for all it was worth, man, like to, to their advantage. Uh, it was a... I mean, the Marvel method style is was all about the artist, you know, structuring out the story in a visual way. It was a it was graphic storytelling approach, and they ran wild with it, man. Draw something fly on every fucking page. Yeah, shooter left, and the image dudes kind of flourished. Yes, <laughs> for sure, man. Fun to revisit. K Fabers, like, follow. Subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. Jimmy, what you got? Join me on patreon.com slash jimrug where you can download my out-of-print hard-to-find zines and mini-comics. You can see a lot of my original art and how I make comics like Street Angel, Octobriana, and much more. Patreon.com slash jimrug. Uh, check out Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics. Uh, check out my Patreon and uh, check out my YouTube channel, Total Recall Show. Red Room Comics in the Wild, uh, Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit, every month, new issue, and they're all self-contained. Uh, get them put on your pull list at your local comic shop, or order or pre-order the comics through the Fantagraphics website. You can also uh, check out the comics ahead of time, uh, before they hit paper, at my Patreon, patreon.com slash edpiscor, three bucks for the archive there. All these links are in my link tree in the description below. Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. I gotta go revisit that Jim Lee Artist Edition after taking a look at these issues, man. Jimmy, give them the marching orders. We're gonna be on our way. Read more comics.